In molecular dynamics, atoms are typically represented as single point masses inside van der Waals potentials. And what were the 6, 12 potentials typically used to represent such things? This means that they come out mostly as hard spheres. Partial charges are then calculated via some form of quantum method to represent the distribution of electronic charge on those molecules. For a polar molecule like water, these partial charges can actually be quite large, with the best part of a full formal negative charge on the oxygen atom. In molecular dynamics, bonds are typically represented as simple harmonic oscillators, as are the angle constraints. To start the simulation, a range of velocities is chosen that matches the Boltzmann distribution for that temperature, and then those velocities are assigned randomly to each atom. Similar methods are then used to put energy into the bonds, angles, and dihedrals. The simulation is then run according to Newtonian physics, with the molecules transferring both energy and momentum to one another via electrostatics and van der Waals interactions. So in these simulations, water is essentially a hard sphere with three-point charges in it. Surprisingly, such a simple method for modeling these systems gives surprisingly good results on numerous physical properties that can be calculated. Maybe the best of these is the structure. So if we plot the average probability of finding an oxygen in a unit volume with distance out from a specific water molecule, we get what we would call a radial distribution function. Now it turns out these structural functions can actually be measured directly via experimental methods such as neutron scattering. As you can see, these very simple methods do a okay job of modeling the structure of water. Now we can also do this with other solutes in water. Say for instance, here we have pyridine in water. And the beauty of these molecular dynamic simulations is that we know everything about these systems. So here we can actually quite clearly see that the pyridines prefer to interact with each other in a T-type fashion. And with some extra pouring over the data, we can work out how this would manifest itself in the experimental measurement. And this is the core of the work that we do. While molecular dynamics of relatively simple systems like water can be fairly successful, it really is the more complicated systems such as protein substrate interactions and how species translocate across membranes and so forth that are the real pertinent questions in biochemistry. And while the simulations are a fantastic way of getting insight into these problems and visualizing them, the answers that you get will only be as good as the parameterization of your model. It's garbage in, garbage out, and that's the ever-present caveat associated with molecular dynamics. Now, while molecular dynamics is a very solid player when it comes to gaining molecular insight into the behavior of such systems, it turns out that in many biological systems, the devil is in the detail. For instance, take a model system, guanodinium, an almost pervasive molecular motif. We know that the real subtle changes in the guanodinium force field can change the form of the guanodinium-guanodinium cation-cation interaction from stacking to T-type. Now, such problems may seem trivial until you realize the potential impact that such changes could have on the thousands of molecular dynamics studies done every year. The amino acid arginine is a key part in many voltage sensing channels, and it's been tied to important interactions in many protein-protein associations, and is doubtless an important interaction in determining protein folding pathways. The refinement of these details is critical to the development of this field. And this is the sort of work that we do, in that with appropriate structural measurements, usually from neutron scattering, we can actually refine the details of the model and subsequently elucidate which are the important interactions that are critical in many biological systems.